Good morning. Any, any, you know, I walked in today, I saw a few, but is there anybody here for the first time? Anybody? Want to dearly raise your hand? Anybody? No? Okay, I didn't see you. I was trying to embarrass somebody. I didn't, they didn't come this morning. Remember I told you I had an awesome testimony last week? Well, they were supposed to be here this morning. Well, they're, <laughs> I'll be calling them soon. <laughs> but you know the really cool thing about that testimony? I had a chance on Monday to see the, sis, the brother of, the, of the, the lady I told you last week that we had an awesome encounter with last Saturday night. And we were talking, and he goes, you know, it's really funny. She ended up st- his sister ended up staying at her, her house or his house overnight, and they were going to come last week. They didn't. And he said, you know, she woke up the next morning after praying, you know, getting saved and having her life just complete. And she looked at her brother and said, you're never going to believe this. But in 10 years of all the pain and sickness I've been in, I woke up for the first time in my life not, not in pain. You know, isn't it funny? We didn't pray. We, didn't, we, didn't, we just prayed for her to have Jesus come in. And, you know, and when he comes in, he wants to do it all. So that's awesome. But I was really hoping to embarrass them this morning, and I didn't see them walk in, so I thought I might as well just ask a vague question. And just they didn't know I was picking on them, but it's too late. All right, so if you have your Bibles, uh, let's open to Colossians 1. But as we do this, it's going to be the, the, uh, the introduction is going to just get us to that verse. As we talk throughout um, the, the last days and the age that we're living in, there's a lot of people who want to put a blame and assessment on God that doesn't exist. We talked a little bit about this last week, but I want to tell Kenny this week when I was talking, I really just want to keep jumping in this because a lot of people want to blame God for things he doesn't do or give credit to God for things he doesn't do either. And when we do that in the natural mind, we end up, on, on, not knowingly, we end up putting people against God because God doesn't do evil. God can't do evil. God's only good. And when evil things happen in this world, we're going to talk about that in a minute. When evil things happen in this world, it's because the choices that were made, or we live in a fallen world, by the way, that sin does exist in. Do you know that sickness did not exist when it was, when it was a, a perfect world? But when sin entered the world, so did sickness, right? So we live in a fallen world that has disease, it has sin, it has a lot of bad stuff going on right now. But the only way as Christians we can continue to combat the world's idea about God is to promote the fact that God does good. And I, and I shared a little bit this with you last week. One of the turning points in that testimony last week when that girl decided to start hearing it is when I looked at her and said, hold on, why are you blaming God for the death of someone you love dearly? God doesn't prematurely kill people. God, it, John 10, 10, the verse that we all should live by, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you have life and life of abundance, a wholeness. Long days shall you be satisfied with. Uh, and, and when we live it, in the, but with the qualification right there in the Ten Commandments, if honoring your father and mother is one of the greatest ways to have long days, not because they can kill you, which is part of, you know, you know we, we, which sometimes we feel like that with our kids, but no, it's because the, the respect and honor we give our parents also shows the fact that we have an, a, a position of honor to God, too. And that honor is what, how your days be long and blessed. So there's a contingency upon a promise, which we're going to see a lot of. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we, we'll get this in a second. All of God's promises are yes and amen. God is every single, the yes means, Lord, will you do it? Yes, my word is already there. But the waiting for it to be accomplished is us in our obedience, in our life to do it. And so we know that God, first of all, I'm going to throw two words out there that are really popular in the world. God is omnipotent and God is sovereign. The word sovereign is greatly, greatly mis- misused, especially if you have certain belief systems about um, theology, which we won't get into this morning. But God is omnipotent. All power, that word means all power is derived from God, exists in God, and he is all power. There is no power that has ever come from this planet without deriving from God himself. So then we, where'd evil come from? Well, Lucifer, God created. And Lucifer had a free will. And Lucifer and a third of the angels rebelled and came against God and therefore chose to evil over good. And there is your source of evil. How did sin get in the world? God created Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve had a choice in the garden. They chose wrong, and sin entered the world. 
So God created a perfect world with a, with a perfect idea. But you know one thing that's great about our perfect and awesome God? He had a plan of salvation because according to Scripture, he had a lamb prepared for us before the foundation of the world. Even though he prepared for perfection, he also was prepared for failure because that's how he is today. When we fail, we have a Savior. When we fall down, he can pick us back up. But we have to choose to walk this thing. So sin and sickness and, and, and fallen nature and evil did not come from God. All the power that he gave them, they chose to use evil. And then Satan became the power of the prince of the air, according to the New Testament. And that evil still exists in the world today. So if you guys want to know where evil came from, there's your 30-second overview of why evil is in the world today. It absolutely has nothing to do with God. God did not create evil, and God is not evil. And God hates evil. He wants the goodness of God to be brought out there. And so the world needs to see this as a church. We need to do a better job letting the, church, the world know that God is good. God only does good. And when they start, they start assessing evil to God, we need to be alarmed. And I, and I played that song last week for you um, about everyone talks to God. And, and, and that verse is when you're mad about God calling a loved one home. Well, you know what? The problem is the world thinks that every time. Well, God just needed their angel. Well, there are so many things wrong with that statement. First of all, humans don't become angels. So just on a side note to ruin your theology, number one is God, and God doesn't need anyone in heaven right now. Do you know that? God did not call your loved one home because he needed them in there because there's more for them to do in heaven than on earth. Not true. We live in a world where the, the, there is evil. And evil happens, and it overcomes, and we have to stand firm, stand strong, and be alert. That's why there's the spiritual warfare, is, 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 most of warfare is just being alert. Knowing, he says, do not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. It didn't say go know and study his schemes. It, don't be ignorant of it. Know them at least. Know what he's doing, and so that, therefore we can continue to rise up. Remember, light dispels darkness. The greatest spiritual warfare you have in your life is worship and praise. Light dispels darkness. So when you know the enemy's planning something over there, go ahead, turn on a praise CD and start praising God and letting the glory of God, the light of his glory, shine and overcome darkness. We have to overcome good with evil, or evil with good by the actions that we do on this earth, whether we, we create this atmosphere everywhere we go. So just like Adam and Eve fell, but this is, but all authority and power. But look at this. Starting in the very beginning, God created, we told you, Lucifer, he created, Adam and Eve. But even before that, in the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. God had all authority over mankind, over angels, over demons, over people, and even over this planet. Therefore, if you notice, there's nothing left out. God has ultimate authority over everything. He is all-powerful. There is nothing outside of his grasp and realm. I love that in, 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 uh, in Jeremiah 32, it says, is there nothing too difficult for you? <laughs> That's rhetorical. Of course not. God is awesome. He's mighty. He is uh, absolutely, he is he's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He's it. And is he sovereign? He is sovereign over what you let him be. There's a difference between those two words. Sovereign does not mean God is in control of everything. If you believe that, then let's talk about that for a second. God, this idea. Yesterday I was in an appointment. I can say this, yeah. Yesterday I was in an appointment with a, with a young couple that I'm preparing to get married. And I was with them. I began to talk about, <laughs> as you do, the, 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 the planning of the service. And I said, okay, so what's the roles of the mother? And I just, as soon as I said it, I'm like, ah, shoot. Last, last summer, um, this young man lost his mom in a car accident. And it's like, oh, no. And he says to me, well, don't worry about it. It's all good. It's all, it is what it is. It is what it is. It's fine. I said, no, it's not. No, it's not. And so we went and finished up the, service, this, the conversation here. I was here yesterday. And afterwards, I said, can I talk to you a little bit about what you said earlier? It's fine. And I had a chance to share some of this very same stuff yesterday. But here's the deal. When people want to attribute these things to God, oh, I just it's, it's okay. You know, I, it's all going to be good. God, God, God's going to work it all out. 
That's not what those verses mean. It's not good when you lose somebody. And of course, me losing my mother in that same period of time, I was able to relate and end up having a very, very awesome time there yesterday because of this, this opportunity. But it's so heartbreaking to think that people just say, oh, it is what it is. It's fine. It's good. It's all good. You know they don't mean that, right? There's pain. There's frustration. There's anger underneath those. It's all fine stuff. And we as Christians, I believe, need to be armed in this last days, ready to wage war against evil with good. If we could just convince the world that God's good and that he doesn't hate Um, let's see, like the one sign out there says God hates queers or whatever that is. If we could just stop that lingo and just realize that God loves everybody and he wants them to get saved just as bad. Let's stop the garbage of trying to fight against each other with, with just certain lifestyles. You know what? Sin is a lifestyle. Let's just come against that instead. Instead, we as a church, we want to pick on one more than the other. Is it because that one maybe has thrown our face more? Yes, I understand that. And yes, we'll continue to take a stand, but that's not. Why don't we just take a stand for righteousness and truth and holiness and goodness and the greatness of God? When we focus on the goodness of God, maybe we won't be so over here with the other stuff. I would love to see this church full of people who used to be in those lifestyles. But the only way they're going to come in here is if one of us reaches out to them in the lifestyle they're in, no matter what sinful lifestyle it might be. We have to go out, and we'll get to that in just a second. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. But when we understand, let's get back to my, no, my, 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 let's get back to the system here. When we understand that God is sovereign, which means God is, is, is all powerful and has all control, but then when we understand this all sovereign, all powerful God decided to give that authority over Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve chose to what? give that authority away. He cho- they chose at that point to let the enemy take that authority back over them and now sin enter the world. Let's jump ahead a couple thousand years because after free will was given, Jesus came on the earth and he died on the cross as we know the story of salvation. And at that point, he took the keys to hell, death, the grave. He took it back and he got authority back. But Satan is still reigning and roaming in the air, right? The power of the prince of the air still exists today. So it's not like all of a sudden all evil was done away with. Now he made another power. He's, he came and took authority back where the, we, the, it was given. And then the greatest one is in, in Matthew 28. Now all authority has been given unto you. So, with this being said, summary, because I, I want to get to the message. It's all just, just, all just uh, you know, uh, introduction this morning. All authority God has is in him. It was taken from him because it was given away by free will, but then it was taken back by him because he chose to do it the right way through offering his son and now giving that authority unto us. Therefore, everything that happens on this earth today, we have authority over through Christ now, we have authority over. So this idea that we want to blame anything on something else and something else, the Bible says that God has now given you all authority. All the power you need to live holy, righteous, healthy, blessed, whatever you want to be in life, it rests inside of you now. We have the choices to make. If we choose good, then we yield to goodness. But if we choose evil, then we have evil abounding. And as Christians, we have to understand that we've got to stop now just saying, well, whatever, whatever. Every day you wake up in the morning, you have a choice to make. Whether you want to live righteous or not. Whether you want to take those thoughts captive or not. We live every single day based on the choices that we make. And when you understand this, when those thoughts come at you and they feel like they're you, that's because the enemy knows What buttons to push? Oh, it feels so real. It seems so real. Of course it does. He's not going to tempt you with something that's way out there that doesn't tempt you. And so some of us in this room, when it comes to winning the battle, number one, of our daily life, every single morning, I I really believe this. Do we surrender to to, to Jesus and say, Lord, today I choose to live for you. 
I choose to, to whatever choice I make, I want to live according to your word, and I want my mind and my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions to line up with your word. Redirect every single morning, because if you don't, your thoughts can lead you down paths that are, are very, very dangerous in the world today. Guard your heart by what comes in your mind. When these thoughts come and we don't take them captive, we become prey to the enemy now to attack us in all areas of our life. I just shared this earlier with somebody this week. After it goes on, talks about our, our, our mind being renewed, right? And then James has this great thing in James 1. It says, it says if any of you ask, lacks wisdom, ask God. And he will give it to you without finding any fault. He'll give you wisdom when you ask. But then he goes on to say what? But when you ask, don't ask and be double-minded. For a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. Interesting. So you get wisdom, you get truth, you get revelation from God or in the Word, or revelation in prayer, and you choose the lie over the truth. What are you? Unstable in all your ways. Because when you become double-minded, two th thoughts of patterns in your life, one is truth-based, and one is emotion, feeling, and a lie from the enemy. And when both of these feel right to you, you become unstable. Can we relate to that at all? I know I can't. I'll tell you right now. I know that when I even allow a thought to come in my mind that is contrary to what God has said about me, about my life, about my family, about whatever, if I don't take it captive, it can lead to fear. It can lead to anxiety. It can lead to anger. It can lead to a lot of other things. Depression. But when we choose to go back and take an ax to root that source of that thought and realize that it is contrary to God's word over my life, fear can't go anymore. I won't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing but everything. Prayer and supplication, bring it before the Lord. Now I'm bringing those things before the Lord, and I'm trusting that he is going to be able to perform. And we'll get to that in just a minute. The prayers of the saints. I believe if there's one thing that maybe we ought to focus on a little bit more, Prayer changes things. Prayer is the very words we speak represented authority of God on this earth. How did God release his authority? Let there be. He spoke them out. When we understand, and I challenge you every day, if your prayer life is a nice, quiet prayer life between you and God, and there's never, I challenge you to change it right now. Pray and enjoy the presence of God and then declare truth over your day out loud. Speak into existence what you believe you want to see and receive. Because when you can speak that out there, that is when faith is released. And that is prayer. Someone asked me to pray for something. My prayer life is, I have two types of prayer life. One is between me and God. And that's my relational prayer. My relational prayer between me and God is just me talking to him as a friend or as king, whatever atmosphere he, we need that day, or as one who is in all authority and I need to repent. Whatever it is, that's one avenue of prayer. It's relational. The other one is intercessory prayer, and that is my intercessory prayer, by the way. I don't, I'm not an intercessor by calling, but it doesn't mean I don't can't. My intercessional prayer life is about this long. If you come to me and say, brother, I need you to pray for me. Okay, what's the need? I need, I, you know, my, uh, so-and-so is sick. They need healing. Okay, all right, let's agree. And in three sentences to four sentences later, I'm done praying. Why? Because God doesn't need a long, long, long laundry list of why this person's sick and what they're going through. All we need to do is declare the word of God and speak truth because we need to speak that into existence because right now what's in existence is a lie. They're living, they're living under a, a, an evil society that was created by sin. So what do we do? We impose righteousness by speaking out over it. And so if you have sickness in your body, the best way to overcome it is what? Declare truth. Declare God's word. If you have sin that you have committed in your life, what's the best way to get rid of it? Confess it. And confess what was done for you. I don't grovel at the feet of Jesus. When I, when I sin, Lord, forgive me. Thank you. Oh, that becomes a worship service right there itself. That's it. Thank you. 
Thank you for your cleansing. Thank you for your forgiveness. Oh, it feels so good to be free and clean. Why? Because he did it for me. That's repentance to me. It's confessing what you did is wrong and acknowledging what Jesus did for you is already there. It's acknowledging, and when we as Christians can get out of the mindset that we have to somehow get to a certain place, we learn that in Christ, we have to speak and declare the word of truth in our life. If it's sin, sickness, if you're over your children, you know, um, it depends on how old your kids are. They get older and you end up praying different a little bit, but you know what? You still pray. What do you do? Do you pray in fear like Job did? Do you pray worrying about them? I don't think that's, that's going to be a fruitful prayer. But what if we just spoke truth over them? What if our prayer life over your children were this? Lord, I thank you right now that my child is in your hands. I thank you right now that they are blessed of the Lord. They are covered and protected by the blood of Jesus. Wow, all of a sudden, do you know what? All of a sudden, you, start, might believe, you might start believing that a little bit. You might start just speaking out a little bit more there, and it might encourage you. Because rather than going to the throne in fear, you're going with boldness. You're going with the fact that you know that your intercession for your child or your friend or your family or whatever it might be, you're going with the confidence to know that the word is on your side. We have that authority to do those things. As a church, I would like to see us do a better job standing with those people and declaring with them. One can slay a thousand and what? Two ten thousand. I believe the power that we have to declare word, the word of God over each other's lives is massive. And if we could take more advantage of it, that we would stand together in faith, agreeing for such things. And I'll tell you this, I'm not going to rebuke you openly. I might say something to you privately. But we don't need these long, drawn-out prayers of, of sympathy and sorrow. You know what you do? That's when you sit with somebody and you love them. That's the sympathy part. If someone's going through a trial, the sympathy part is being there as a friend loving them. But the prayer part should be one of authority, one of, 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 of God's word going forth and changing an atmosphere. It was awesome. When I get to go into hospital rooms and pray for people, one of the greatest things I do when I walk in that room, I pray, Lord, let this atmosphere change when I walk in that door. And let the words that we say declare change that this person will not stay there but get up. I want to expect that every, every place I go and we should all do that. That's the authority that we have on this earth. It goes in you, through you, and with you. Everywhere you go, you carry that kind of authority. Life-changing authority. Let there be light. Boom, light appears. And now he's given us that same authority to speak in faith and exist the same thing. Now, jumping ahead, okay, since I'm, I totally got off my notes, by the way, but going back, go over a, 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 a couple books before that, Ephesians chapter 2. It's like I'm racing today, and I don't, I'm not even in a hurry. got to slow down. Ephesians 2, this is the awesome, um, I've already basically been preaching this, so we're just going to start and, and, and go backwards a little bit here, but you, you have to get a good... Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to, um, you know, the first few verses, the verses in chapter 2 is talking about you used to be a sinner. You used to be in control by them. You walked according to the course of the, this world, verse 2, according to the prince of the power of the air. There's the, what we just talked about, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That's what we came from. Among whom also, verse 3, that had conversation in times past, the lust and of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Those were the choices that we made before Christ. We lived under that bondage. We lived willingly, choosing to live into that um, system, yielding ourselves to the power of the prince of the air, yielding ourselves to evil, and yielding ourselves to our minds not renewed in truth. But, verse 4, but God, who is rich and abundant in mercy, and for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, <clears throat> hath quickened us up together in Christ by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now let me stop if you have your Bibles and just hold it, hold your, don't go every, anywhere too far. But Hebrews chapter 1 is one of the greatest things about God having all authority here. Ready? It says this in verse 3 of Hebrews 1. 
who being in the brightness of his glory, expressed image of the person and holding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So that's what Paul right here is describing. When Jesus finished the work, he went to the throne and he sat down in a place of authority. And what did he do when you got saved? He put you in that same place. Now we are seated with him in heavenly places, ruling over this life. We have authority from above, and we don't have to ever be a victim of what's happening on this earth. So he, he made us sit together in, on that throne, that in the ages, verse 7, to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith, that, you, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared, ordained them, which we should walk in them. For by grace you were saved through faith. Not the faith that you have. God gave every single person the plan, a measure of faith. Okay? Everybody has a measure of faith. But when we take that faith and we release it under the grace of that free gift and we receive it by faith, we bring it into our lives and we accept it, we get seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, ruling and having all authority. And he says, and we are his workmanship created in Christ to do good works, which he prepared for us. And then it says at the end of that, that we should walk in them. If we're not walking and we're not seeing a fruitful life, Did we leave out the last few words of that verse? That you should walk in them? One of my favorite verses is Romans 6, 4. That he was buried, we were buried with him through baptism, raised with him, and now seated with him. And he goes, and you too should walk in a newness of life. The should there is for a reason. The should is because we have been given free will today to choose righteousness to choose to walk in the authority that's been given to us in this world. And if we don't, and we're living in failure, we're living in defeat, we're living in sorrow, we're living in whatever might be coming our way, we are not choosing to appropriate what's been given to us. Does this make sense? We are living in failure. We're living in bondage. Not because Jesus is not all-powerful. Not because the God of the universe is not omnipotent. Not because he hasn't given us provision to be free. We are not appropriating it in our life. We are not living free. We're not living healed. We're not living blessed. We're not living what's been promised to us because we've chosen not to do so. I know this might seem a bit hard, but we have the privilege of walking out a life that has been promised to us in the Word of God to be healthy, to be free, to be whatever it is that He's promised us, saved, whole, 2 Peter 3 says, God's God's not willing that any should perish. Then why are we not out there trying to go? And and Romans 10 tells the only way they're going to hear it is if we go out and preach it to them. You can pray for lost people all day long, but until you go out and knock on their doors, they're not going to get saved. Amen? Very few times do I get invited to go to someone's living room like last week and sit across from a table and get a chance to pray and see them get saved. Very few times in my life. Normally it's because we've been actively looking actively pursuing at work are we taking advantage of those opportunities those co-workers that don't know Christ I, re- I already quoted this verse earlier but 2 Corinthians chapter 1 mm-hmm. verse 20 it says this for all of God's promises or all the promises of a God in him are yes and and amen, unto the glory of God. Could you read those last two words? By us. How are God's promises going to be performed on this planet? By us. We're not waiting on God to do something. This idea that I'm mean, telling you, I really does. Oh, we're just waiting on the Lord. Why? He already did what he did. He's not going back on the cross. He's not giving you any more. He already gave, he gave you everything, according to Ephesians 1. Everything you need for life and godliness is already yours. When we understand right now in this room that there's nothing more that you need from God, you have it all, 
That might change the way you think. You do not need anything more. You have been given the Holy Spirit. You've been given authority. You've been given the grace. You've been given everything you need to obtain life and godliness. Paul says that here in 1 Corinthians. He says it in Ephesians. 1 Peter says it in chapter. We've been given everything we need. The fact that we keep trying to get more and more, and this idea that Christians have to go, oh, we're going to go to a deeper place. You know what that deeper place is? Less of you. Because the less of you that exists, the more of him will exist. The idea that we're going to have to go somewhere greater to get something greater is a fallacy because the greater things that we do is the greater work he does in us and the deeper work is the deeper work he does in us. I believe revival is what, I've said this for years, I'll say it again. D.L. Moody is one of my favorites. Back in the day when they said, Lord, we're going to pray for revival, I've shared this story a hundred times, I'm sure you've heard it. And D.L. Moody goes, good, you know what? I got an idea. I'm going to go up to my prayer closet. I'm going to draw a circle around myself, and I'm going to pray for everything inside that circle until revival happens. I want to see revival. Well, revival starts with me. It starts with this thing right here, getting under submission to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to consume every part of me and fill me up to all capacity that it becomes so overflowing out of that circle that it affects everyone else's life. I want to see, we got some lights going on. I said, look, you guys are getting all attention on Ashley right there. <laughs> I'm seeing it blinking like, wow, what are you guys doing? I looked up twice thinking, is there a flashlight? No, just, just the brightness of your appearance. But either way, God is longing for the church to grab a hold of the truth. That, I'm, I'm, I just, please, hear my heart. This idea that we're chasing and chasing after something gets old. Anybody? Just hold, hold just for a minute. If we keep having to chase after, God's not running from you. And God's not going to go down the cross and do more for you. He has given us everything we need. But we need to embrace that. And we need to yield to that. And I believe we're going to see an outpouring of God's spirit because he's going to pour out more through us because he has a more yielded vessel. He has a more free vessel. He has stuff that's got rid of some of those impurities in our life and cleansed us up there so there's more room and more opportunity for a pure, undefiled presence of God to flow in through us as Christians. That's why he wants to be holy. Because when the power and the presence of God flows through this vessel, it sometimes gets dirty down the way out. But if it gets clean and pure before him, we become masters. It says, I love this. We become fit for the master's use. I want to be that person. I want us to be that church. That the presence of God is massively enjoyed in this place. So much that it, it consumes us, transforms us, and flows through us to transform an entire city and region. That's revival. You know what's really cool about the thing going on in Asbury College is this. When I was in college... A long time ago, um, 30 years ago, whatever it was, they had the similar thing happen in a couple different Christian campuses. Asbury was one of them, by the way, back in the day, that there was a <coughs> church, uh, Wheaton College. <laughs> you never know. It's <laughs> Never mind. Let me repent for that. Okay, anyways, it was a college. It is a Christian college, but they had a chapel service the same way. And then another church found another, another campus, another, another state found out how to do it. And what they, all they did... Do you know what's, what happened to Asbury, if you haven't followed it? Asbury Christians, it's a Methodist school in, in Kentucky. They had a chapel service like a lot of Christian schools have. And um, one of the students decided they wanted to start repenting. And this, they just decided to keep repenting and repenting, and they're having chapel service every day as people come in. And you know what that is? That's the, ready for, 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 sorry, charismatics. That's old school revival. That's non-charismatic revival. I'm just having fun. I'm, I'm having fun with you. That's the revival I kind of grew up with. And that was the old-fashioned repentance revival, where you go down there and you get before the presence of God and you realize how undone you really are. Like, like that, remember that guy in Isaiah in chap, uh, chapter 6 where he goes, woe to me, I'm undone. I live in a nation of undone, unclean nation. I'm unclean. When we get before the presence of God, we see our nature of what we have become and we need that awesome touch of God. And that's what happens in that college campus. Now, I truly believe 
that is a great move, and that is a great beginning point. I truly do think, as charismatics, as spirit-filled folks, I love the fact that we, after the repentance, get filled with the Holy Ghost and power and have a transforming life ex existence out there. So don't know. I love my history. I love my past, and I respect them 100%. But what's even greater is I was listening to them on Fox News talk about Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. These kids still want more. Fox News had a report from, uh, you know, if you saw it this week, Asbury College, they're talking clearly about Jesus. And goes, I don't know, I just felt the power of the Holy Spirit. Welcome. This is right here on our news. Well, that's, that's a change for once. But don't we want more? But where does it start? On our knees before God. Giving him more. This idea that we haven't made it yet. That we got more to get to. Oh, there's a, lot, there's a lot to do out there. But it starts with us being transformed. It starts with us being consumed with his presence. Consumed with his word. Consumed with him. Yielding ourselves and making daily choices to let the presence and the power of God to consume us that the authority of God will be released through us. We have been given everything we need. There's nothing more to attain. I don't know if I want to, I got in a good grip. I don't know if I want to go back to my notes. Anyways, that was all a little bit extra here. And my heart is crying out for the church to just rise up and say enough. We're tired of living a mediocre life. Status quo is okay. Let's get through the next season of our lives. No, no, why are we getting through it? Let's embrace the season we're in and get the best out of it. You know, I will go, one of the verses I have to close with is Romans 8, 28. For we know that God works all things out for good to those who are loved by him and called according to his purpose. We know that, and that, by the way, here, let, let me jump back to my notes here. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. If you reap the flesh, you reap flesh. If you reap the spirit, you reap spirit. We have a choice every single day of our life who we're yielding to. God will not be mocked. Whatever we sow into, we receive. If you think, and just let me, let me, let me, give me this. I'm speaking to myself just as much. This, this week I went to a concert that I, uh, I was happy to go to. It was fun. It was, uh, it was a very interesting concert, had a, but it was a very pro-America, pro-military, pro-everything. It was a lot of fun to be there. But there was definitely some things that you have to just kind of overlook. But if my life spent every single day at that concert and hearing that kind of language out of people getting, yes, it's rah, rah, America. It was a good show. I like country music, but it is a little bit out there. You know what? If I fill myself with just that every day, I'm going to start talking that way too. If I fill myself with angry music and loud music or whatever kind of music you listen to, let's pick out an all. I mean, because country music's almost pure. I know that because it's got that nice... Right, Kenny? Okay. So either way, just I like to pick on that because... But it doesn't matter what you listen to. If it goes in these ears, it's going to process through this. And if you're angry and you play angry music, you're going to get angrier. If you're sad, you play sad music, you're going to get sadder. But if you play worship music and you allow the presence of God to play through it, it'll transform you. We can go to the movie theater and watch movies that entertain us. But what are we watching? I had a preacher one time when I was a kid say something. Would you allow that to happen in your home? Then why are you allowing it on your TV screens? Now again, that might be extreme, but just put it out there. We are allowing ourselves to be filled and inundated every day with the world's junk. And then we expect to live holy. Do not be deceived. God won't be mocked. Whatever you're sowing into, whatever you're investing your time in, you'll get back. If you're investing your entire world in your, in your family, well, that's great, but is God number one still? Then you should invest in your family 100%, yes. But making sure those priorities, otherwise that could become idolatry. Is your job number one? Well, that's out of order, isn't it? We've got to make sure whatever you're sowing into, you want to reap just that way. I know this, that Matthew 6 says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and then all these other things will be added unto you. If we're keeping our focus right and we're allowing ourselves to be yielded to his plan every day and we choose to live that way, we're going to be walking in that goodness. 
And then Romans 8, 28 comes alive in us again. For we know that God works all things out for good. Why? Because we're called according to purpose. He, when we yield our ways to him, he will work all things out for good. One of the quotes that I have, I, I don't know who's pop. I've read it this week. I probably read 10 people who said the same thing. So we're not going to attribute it to anybody, but somebody besides me made this po quote popular, okay? It says this. We are, free to, we are free to choose our actions, but we are not free from the consequences of them. When we allow things in our lives and we choose sin, we choose something, we're not free to choose the consequences of them. You know, we recently had a situation that uh, someone we love made some bad choices. And we're trying to do everything we can. And we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. Hold on. Not my choice. They made the choice. And the consequences to follow will be willing. And that's it. But here's the good news for every Christian in this room. It reminds me of a day back in the day where we were praying for somebody that God would let them be free from this and free from that. And they ended up going to jail anyways. And they coined a phrase, God will always do good in the midst of it. Do you know that even if you end up in jail or you end up whatever, wherever it might be, God will always work that out for good. Just because your consequences on the earth came, just because you messed up and now you are paying the price doesn't mean that God can't turn something good into that. God will turn all things to good because that is the power. Once we yield it to him, he will turn that power and he will allow something good to come from it. As Christians, I hope my heart is this. We have been given authority on this earth, but are we just using it, abusing it by not allowing God to truly reign in this thing. It's debatable by so many people, all the things, but I know this, that Hebrews, oh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 2, 24 says this, by my stripes, you were healed. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, all my soul and all those with me, bless his holy name. Forget not his benefits. What does he do? He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Well, brother, I don't see that happening in my life. Well, if he said it, I want to activate my faith to start believing it. I want to activate my faith to start walking it out and declaring that, that over my life, whatever it might be you need in your life today. I believe this, that God wants to financially, he wants to set us free too. I'll give you a quick testimony that I need to quit again, that I need to get out of here. You know, Many of you guys know that we've been blessed to have another company. We do a lot of business and work. And the company has just vastly been very good. Um, and this year we are actually just, uh, just last couple days ago, we got a great news on another big thing that's coming our way we're excited about. But you know what's really great when big things happen? You can make big mistakes too. And so I went down to Florida just so I'm just, I love being honest with you guys. You're thinking, man, this guy doesn't probably like confessional period. I went down to Florida, and I brought all my books to my dad, who I respect as one of the greatest men in my life. And I said, Dad, here's my books. And I had them all printed out because he didn't want to read the computer screen. And he goes, wow, those don't look very good. I said, I know. It's the amount of money that can go through an account and not, not stay in your account. It's, and it was just a really eye-opening experience for me because I finally allowed somebody who I trust with my whole life. And that day I told him, all right, Dad, how are we going to fix this? He said, oh, I only have one question for you. Are you willing to stop spending money? I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> That's a silly, silly question. No. He said, how much are you willing to cut? Are you willing to make this hurt for you? Because, granted, you're making, yeah, good, and you're spending, I mean, I, I, this is a company money, too. It's not just my personal, right? He goes, but if you're not willing to make changes, you'll never see this change. If you're not willing to make cuts and sacrifices, you're never going to see yourself walk in the blessing that is promised to you. If my people who are called by my, if, 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 the promises of God are always contingent upon our obedience. So we have tried to make small changes. But the key is this. My dad is where I respect him the most. He will ask you the hardest question in the world. 
He didn't come in the, he could have said, wow, those don't look very good, but I'm sure together we can do something and make it. No, his first question to me was, are you going to change or not? If you're not willing to change and we're not here, then we're going to waste my time down here. And so as we set up a new budget, that was a lot of fun. You mean, I can't, what? Wait a minute here. We go to concerts every, wait a minute here. And you, concert tickets, by the way, have gotten out of control, by the way, on a side note. But you know what? That's our personal life before God. We go to God and we expect him to fix everything, but his first answer to you is, are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to submit? Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to change? He'll pour out everything he's already done for us, and he'll give us everything. Wisdom, everything you need is yours, but it starts with us receiving it, and we can't receive it if we don't humble ourselves and go before him and get to that posture. I, I, my heart is this. This church has the ability to be the most powerful, impacting church in the whole entire planet if we just yield ourselves to the authority that's been given to us and go out and walk this out in the streets. You have been given all authority to be as witnesses out there, but it starts inside of us, recognizing that blessing that is inside of you. Everything you need is already in you. Now, it doesn't mean we don't go search more. And by the way, I will say one thing. The more you get in this, and the more revelation you have of this, the more you'll understand what you do have. So I'm not saying you get more, but the more you know, the more you receive. The more revelation you have, the more you can process it and live it out here. We never stop growing. We, never, we see through a glass dimly. And it says this, Paul, right after it says this, we go from glory to glory. We will continue to increase the more revelation that we have. But we've been given God's authority in this earth to not only in our own lives, but outside of there. It's time for us to walk it out. It's time for us to live out this authority that God's given us to not only transform ourselves, this church, but this entire community. Father, I thank you this morning that as we're here and we're just hearing this, I'm thanking you right now that you, there's nothing else I need from you. You've already done it all. And I pray right now that everyone in this room, just for a second, would focus on that. God, I'm going to stop praying that prayer. I want more. I need more. I need this. I need I, I, this idea that I, somehow I've got to go and get to another realm. I've got to get somewhere more to get fulfilled. Lord, I pray right now where I'm seated. I empty myself first. John 3 says, you increase as I decrease. So therefore, today I choose to decrease. My thoughts, my mindsets, the strongholds I've allowed in my life, the sin, whatever it might be, I choose today to repent and lay them down. Empty this vessel completely of me. Empty every part of me that is me and fill me up with my new nature you every part of you that's already been given to me I choose to receive it now I choose to receive that peace in that perfect love that casts out fear I choose to receive healing and forgiveness and blessing. I choose right now to be filled with all the fullness of God. Holy Spirit, I ask you even now. Whew. Fill us this place. Fill everyone. Let's receive it this morning. Let it be your words. I receive today the fullness. I pray for everyone in this room that has received the baptism. That Lord, there's a fresh baptism of fire upon our lives, even at this very moment. Consuming every part of us. Baptizing us with fresh power, fresh anointing, freshness. That today we, we get rid of all the old and we just receive the new wine in this new wineskin. We put off the old stuff and we receive what's precious and pure.
just right where you're at this morning, just receive. It's not an emotional experience. It's a revelation that should hit you right now. I have everything I need right now. I got it all. I got Jesus, and I have his word. I got everything I need. So today I choose to receive that. Every area of lack, I receive provision. Hallelujah. God, I bless you. As I'm just praying here, I just hear these words. Just, I just pray, like, you know, we hear these words in the old. I just pray that, that not only the fire will come, but I just pray there'd be a fresh wind blowing in a new season of our lives here, transforming us to go to somewhere new. Not staying back in the old ways of doing things. But Lord, we ask that today would be a day we would look forward and go, there was a fresh wind that just blew in our lives. That now it's time for us to do something with it. It's time for us as a church, as individuals, to walk out a new place of victory and freedom. A new place of authority. That we will take this city because it's been given to us. We will stand and believe for our families that's been given to us. And by faith we receive all that you have promised us today. I pray a blessing over everyone in this room now as you walk out of this place today. I pray the transforming work of God's Spirit right now will continue in your life this afternoon and throughout this week as we choose to daily yield and receive what's been given to us. As we choose tomorrow morning to wake up and receive by faith what is ours already, and then daily walk it out. That we might see a week of transformation like we've never seen. Victory after victory, peace after peace, joy after joy. Day after day, we see the goodness of God, and we no longer allow the evil one to have that place anymore in our lives. We're choosing today to walk out of here in our rightful place of victory and authority, and we speak that out in the name of Jesus. Amen.